Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. Today we want to talk about the beginnings here of naval aviation. Now, of course, we had had a Navy yard in Pensacola beginning in the early 1820s. And that yard had functioned until October of 1911 when the Navy Department felt that the yard itself had no future purpose. So they had literally laid off the 250 workers, padlocked the, uh, the fence, and put the, uh, the, the thousand, roughly 1,000 acres that they had here in what we would today call mothballs. And nothing more was thought about it for the moment. Well, meanwhile, uh, the idea of, avi of uh, naval aviation was progressing relatively rapidly, actually. We know, we, uh, everyone remembers the, the story, of course, of the Wright brothers and the, uh, for their first flights at Kitty Hawk in 1903, and then the onset of them, and of the Wright brothers themselves and Curtis, in the work in developing aircraft. And these are two, Curtis and the Wright brothers were, were head-to-head -head competitors in all kinds of aircraft, and this, of course, evolved into, into military interest as well. Uh, we can credit uh, President Theodore Roosevelt with having a, a, a great foresight, as he had in so many things, urging the, the military to become interested in Navy in uh, flight, and of course the Navy did this. Uh, they, they, they went along uh, swimmingly well at the beginning, uh, doing all sorts of interesting things. For, for example, the young uh, Lieutenant Theodore Ellison was the man who first catapulted off a ship because the, uh, the Navy recognized that if they were going to be, use uh, aircraft effectively in their own branch of the service, they had to have uh, aircraft l linked to uh, vessels at sea. This was, uh, Ellison's flight was in 1912, and by that time, the Navy was doing a certain amount of training, uh, first of all at Hammondsport in New York, where, uh, where Curtis operated his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his factory and functions, and of course they began training also at, uh, at uh, Annapolis. Well, Annapolis didn't work too well because the weather was inconsistent, and so uh, uh, the Navy began to look around and say, well, where, what do we have here that where the weather is good? What's available in land and properties where the weather is good? And they said, aha, we have a wonderful facility there at Pensacola, Florida. And so uh, late in 1912, uh, excuse me, 1913, the decision was made they were going to try an experiment. And on the, uh, right in the middle of January of uh, 1914, the USS Mississippi arrived here, accompanied by the USS Orion. And the Mississippi had on board uh, about, 20, about uh, 35 men. Some of them were student pilots, the others were the mechanics and so forth that were, were to handle all of the material. Uh, and they, they had seven flying boats, which were basically hydroplanes. Uh, and they were, they were, these were in crates, and they, were, they, they came, ashore, came ashore here, put up what we, well, basically they were tents along the, along, right along the water so that these, uh, these aircraft could be uh, covered at night, and these these uh, the 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 uh, student pilots and others were under the command of uh, Captain Henry Muston and Lute and uh, uh, Lieutenant John Towers. They moved in and began putting things together, and by the the uh, first effort uh, to go into actual flight training. We came about two weeks later when, uh, when uh, uh, Lieutenant Tower and Godfrey Chevalier uh, made the first experimental flights. Now, you have to think about what it was like. You've got, you've got, these, you've got these, uh, these uh, little tents along the way to, to take care of the, uh, of the aircraft themselves. The men, of, a lot of their duties, of course, had been scurrying around trying to put these buildings back in shape for some of the ones that they could use because they'd been idle for, for several years. But by the, by, within two weeks, they were actively trying to train. And the, they went, they went far forward beautifully, using usually three flights a day. Now what they did then, of course, was they would have these aircraft take off on the water, and they had, they had a large tower right at the edge of the water where a lookout would stand up there, and it was his duty just to keep that plane, every plane in sight, in case something should go wrong. And of course they had a, a patrol boat down up right on the water, an emergency craft, so that if something should go wrong, that boat could zoom out, hopefully, to where the, the, where the plane had gone down. And of course the, the flight pattern it was literally a kind of a kind of a circle around uh, the bay, and they would the flight would take off, reach its maximum height, make the circle, come back and land, and that was one training exercise, and it worked very well for two weeks. Then on on the 16th of February, a Lieutenant James Murray 
uh, was off on his flight, got up into the air. What uh, the estimate was, he was about 600 feet, and apparently the engine failed. It stalled. The plane came down, and as it hit the water, it overturned. And unfortunately, Lieutenant Murray was killed. We, he was our first naval aviation uh, casualty, I guess we could say that. Now, of course, as all of this is taking place, we are right on the verge of war in Europe. But there's also another problem. The United States is involved uh, with the, the Mexican government because all sorts of difficulties have taken place along the border, and the United States is about to send a, an armed force, an armed complement in on the eastern shore at Veracruz to try and put down what was what, what our country simply called a, a hazard to the American interests there. Now for the first, this is now, in, we're late in April of 1914, and so the, the, uh, the military said, well, why don't we use this new naval aviation component to do some good for it? They can be observed. They can get up in the air and see what's going on beyond the very edge of the coastline. And so, the, uh, so indeed, they, they sent three aircraft, the same craft, of course, that were being used at training here on Pensacola, and they were led by a Lieutenant Ballinger. And these, these aircraft went down, they made their flights, they served there for about three weeks, and of course the, the men who came back had some harrowing stories because they were under, under fire from a small arms fire from the ground, and the, the aircraft literally had, had bullet holes in them, but not everyone got back safely, and everyone said, well, now, didn't they do a good job? And they did. Well, things move forward. World War II began, or excuse me, World War I began in Europe in, uh, in August, and uh, very shortly thereafter, of course, for about 18 months after that, the United States became involved. But even before that, much greater emphasis was being placed on military, on naval uh, flight training here, because there was, it was obvious that the United States might might become involved in Europe. Now, as all this was going on, there is a continuing competition between Curtis and Wright uh, aircraft manufacturers. And of course, in Europe, uh, uh, manufacturing companies in France, in Britain, and especially in Germany had been moving ahead with all sorts of advanced design. So here in Pensacola, there was a constant uh, kind of a race to catch up and be certain that they were, they were current in what they were going to do. Well, all of this was fine, but, we, we, but even before the United States States became technically involved in the war, uh, something else was added here. At this point in time, there was a, a growing interest in what they called lighter than aircraft. Now, they, this was uh, uh, kites, uh, weather balloons, small blimps, and even the larger fixed, uh, fixed frame dirigibles. And Pensacola, uh, in late 1915, became involved in training for three of those various aircraft. The, they were, the Navy was working with the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, and they brought in the, the aircraft and the facilities, and they pretty well cleared off the land on which the original uh, Navy uh, Yard Village of Woolsey had existed, and this became the, the training ground for the lighter than aircraft. And they did all sorts of exciting things here, there are some wonderful stories about how these blimps would get up in the air and flight around and, and they would literally attract people and, and uh, uh, how, how people, how young boys in the town would love to, to work with them. And of course, uh, some of the people that were, were here were being trained as weather observers. They would work, fly in balloons and uh, one of the families in particular, of course, became very, very fascinated with this. And uh, as a result of this, uh, one of their members became a flight, a, a weather observer and did wonderful things. And still another one, another member of a similar family became a, a racing balloonist who raced uh, not only in the United States, but all over Europe. This was after the war was over, of course. So this activity, lighter than aircraft, was, was big time here for about three years. Uh, we did, I should add, add uh, just parenthetically here, that a little bit later, we actually did have a visit here from one of the, uh, the large dirigibles that the Navy constructed, the, uh, the Los Angeles, which came to Pensacola and was, was moored out at the, uh, at the Naval Air, Sta Air Station. And it was, a, of course, a curiosity. But unfortunately, by the time the, uh, the World War I was over, uh, the, the uh, scientists with Goodyear prevailed, and they, they just felt that they could do better with the, having the, all this, uh, this experimentation and training back home. So uh, at Lakehurst, New Jersey, and then in Akron, Ohio, that's where they moved it all, and unfortunately, Pensacola lost that. Well, when, as, we got, as the country got into World War I, uh, training accelerated here at Pensacola. And uh, again, uh, new aircraft were brought in. Uh, people, the, some of the pilots who were being trained, particularly in the, what they call the French Newport. Uh, these men were being trained as, uh, to do all sorts of things in the war, and when the United States became actively involved, 
Ultimately, about a thousand people overall had been trained, and a, the first uh, the first significant number of them uh, were sent to uh, to Europe to be to work in this uh, this. Uh, in behalf of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the combined Allied armies, and these men were, were led by uh, Lieutenant Ken Kenneth Whiting, for whom Whiting Field would later be, be named here. These, uh, the men that were tra had been trained here were sent, and they were then spread among the, the French, the English, and the Italian allies, and they were, they were basically observers more than that. We have, we have no record, at least that I could come upon, where any of the pilots who were trained here were in actual uh, combat over Europe. But that, of course, uh, was another part of the story. Well, the, the, the war ended. People came back and, and looked at what had we accomplished? How, what had naval aviation done? And everyone said, well, it, obviously it has a future. And as they were discussing this, uh, one, of the, one of the admirals of the time came to Pensacola and made a speech that absolutely stunned the community leaders here. He said, look, what you've been able to do so far here has been totally in the use of planes uh, which landed and took off on water. Uh, you don't have facilities for, the, for land base activity, and unless you get that, the, your, your time in naval aviation is going to be very short. So quickly, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary Club, the Kiwanis Club, and a number of others came together, and they worked cooperatively to find a piece of land which they could use, uh, could convert into a landing field, a training field for the Navy, and they did. Uh, they actually, they, they found two. One was out along what was then called the Pottery Plant Road, another one was pretty close to actually part of the property which ultimately became Quarry Field, much closer to NAS Pensacola. Uh, along the way, of course, uh, uh, the community got together with this, and they had a, the, the citizen leaders had a, a, a dual purpose. They wanted to preserve the Navy's activities here, but they could look ahead and see that there was a possibility for commercial aviation, that we might be uh, find a way to get companies active in carrying passengers and freight in and out of Pensacola, and that was part of the view, and of course, they were successful. The, these new fields were operational by late 1922, and we did, as a result, we did save Pensacola to maintain itself as the cradle of naval aviation. Now, one thing I neglected to say at the beginning, and I, I, it, it's kind of fun to, to recall back this, when we got into naval aviation training here, our, our, this facility was called the Pensacola Aeronautical Station. That was what we were called. We weren't NAS at that point. Pensacola Aeronautical Station was the title, and it hung on for a good many years. And of course, the, the, uh, when, the, uh, when World War II, World War I ended, and we went back to normal training, the, 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 the program and the facilities remained pretty static up into the early part of the 1930s. And I'm, I'm gonna close off my story at that point because because the others are much better qualified to tell the, the future story of naval aviation training. But in the early part of the Depression, the economic condition of the country and the military became so severe that for the years 1932, 33, and part of 1934, there were no aviation training classes at all. It literally cl closed down. The, uh, the station itself remained open, but basically the, the function that it was supposed to handle uh, basically was closed down. Well, we can look back now on naval aviation, of course, as the cradle uh, of a, a, a major economic element of the area that, that, we, that it serves. We are so fortunate to have naval aviation here. We have gone through a whole Oh, many generations of different kinds of aircraft. We brought on board the the Blue Angels as a training, as a a, a marketing function of the Navy and a, a, a function that everyone uh, in the area and of course across the country uh, enjoy so much. But we can look back and say that those men who had the foresight to bring naval aviation here back in 1914 established something great. And we can look back also to people like like Wright and uh, and the Wright and the, and Curtis and the things that they did to make all of this possible. It's amazing to look at it, but remember that the, the planes that were in training here first in 1914 probably flew as much as uh, at a rate of about 75 miles an hour, and when we look at the Blue Angels today, who knows how fast they can go. So naval aviation and Pensacola, they, they go together, and that's a, certainly a part of the story of North America's first place city.